Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Um, we will start with this afternoon's session. I hope uh, everybody can hear me, yeah. Um, yes, please come in. Uh, we have a very special guest all the way from Canada, uh, Peter McLeod, a very warm welcome to you. Um, Peter McLeod is one of Canada's leading experts in public engagement. He's the principal of uh, Mass LBP, which, to make a small correction on what Roger just said, is not <laughs> merely a for-profit organization. Um, uh, this is entirely incidental. Um, a mass LBP is actively cross-subsidizing deliberative processes with its public sector strategy work. So it's not um, a, a for-profit organization per se. I would say if you really want to make money, you probably don't go into democracy work. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but um, mass, the microphone, sorry. It's a kind of inconvenient. Um, Mass LBP um, is um, uh, a very groundbreaking organization which has led, I think, most of the most original and, and ambitious citizens' assemblies and citizens' panels in Canada uh, on topics varying from culture, arts, urban planning, health systems. And at this moment, Mass LBP is chairing the Canadian Citizens' Assembly on Democratic Expression, uh, which is really a very unique uh, three-year parallel process taking place in six uh, time zones. And the first cohort recently uh, published its report uh, containing 34 recommendations to regulate social media and to reduce the prevalence of harmful and hateful speech. So if that's not revitalizing democracy, I don't know what is. Um, Peter, a very warm welcome to you, and I'm happy to give the floor to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ava. And, and just give me a thumbs up. I want to make sure you can hear me OK, and I want to make sure that you can see the slide that I put up. Yes, Excellent. We can see the slides, and we can hear you perfectly. Yes. OK. Very good. So, um, I mean, first of all, it's really a delight to be able to join the Hannah Arendt Center for this, this conference that I know has been, Roger, several years in the making, and it's a credit to you and your team and your forbearance and being able to pull all of this together. Uh, I, I count a number of friends in the room, and I, I feel really badly that I'm not able to get down and join you. I am what in this very modern world, I guess, is now referred to as a vaccine mutt having had one dose of one formulation and another of uh, uh, mRNA. And, and apparently the US border has some concerns about this. So until it does, uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Port Hope, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Ontario, traditional and unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee, about 100 kilometers east of Toronto. Um, it's especially uh, wonderful to be able to follow Michael McKenzie uh, who, if he's in the room right now, I count uh, as a, a very dear friend. And, and he and I first met back in 2006, both working on different aspects of the Ontario Citizens Assembly uh, on electoral reform. And, and we've obviously each taken different paths. Michael, a, a serious uh, and very impressive scholar, as now you're all aware. And, and, and me, just trying to kind of keep a, a good thing going from that uh, original experiment in Canada, because of course, as I think many people are aware, who are familiar with the Ontario and British Columbia experience, while these were really critical precedents, it's, it's not like they enjoyed a lot of love uh, from our political class on the other side of those processes. And our work at Mass has been to try and, and demonstrate the value and potential of this work across a very wide range of public sector concerns. Um, what I'd like to do with my time today is, is kind of uh, describe where I think we're at. This talk called Democracy Second Act and a focus on citizens' assemblies. And, and like Michael and David, I would absolutely subscribe to their concerns about the, the use of exclusive terminology like citizenship. It's not actually a selection criteria when we're 
convening. But I, I want to describe where I think we're at because it's a very significant juncture. And I, I want to try and, and describe a little bit about where we're headed. And, and to all of the very good theorists in the room, you'll appreciate how much progress has really been made over the course of, of the past 30 or 40 years from the advent within democratic theory and speculation about a critical deliberative turn to now being able to speak much more confidently about what the OECD has referred to as a deliberative wave. And, you know, to be working in this space right now is to be working in an area where, I mean, we've just seen it today in Paris, there's constantly new innovation and advances and a sense of real hopefulness and momentum. Now, um, I, I think to use um, the Douglas Copeland's line, or William Gibson's, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And so we are seeing bright sparks largely across uh, Europe right now, but of course in jurisdictions like Canada and Australia, sister countries, uniquely federal systems that are conducive to this. And I'm gonna talk a little bit why about why I think the United States is about to come online in a powerful way. So just to enumerate some of the things that, that now we almost take for granted in this work that you couldn't point to 10 years ago, much less 20. We have a wide range of organizations, mass sure amongst them, uh, distributed across Europe and the US and through Latin America and increasingly Asia. And these organizations take many different forms. Some of them are government units within um, jurisdictions like Scotland, uh, where it's providing in-house capacity to design and deliver assemblies. We have, of course, uh, organizations in the UK like Involved, uh, the Democratic Society, Mission Publique, uh, the um, Democracy Garage in Denmark and beyond, uh, which are nonprofits uh, or uh, social enterprises that exist to support government's efforts um, and to provide some independence um, so that these can be uh, executed with a high degree of integrity, but we also have multilateral organizations uh, really championing this work. So, of course, the OECD, a very conservative institution in normal times, has really been at the vanguard of promoting through its democratic uh, innovations unit um, the, the work that's taken place. We have new language so that the rest of us don't need to walk around talking, thank goodness, about sortition, but can instead be talking about civic lotteries. And we can now find words to describe discrete roles like the civic concierge who is supporting and staffing the members. We can talk about the value of rough consensus. But I think it's also important to observe that this work, like many different kinds of innovations, has moved through already a cycle from those green shoots and innovations that of course began far before uh, BC and Ontario's experiences uh, and which have gone through a phase of permutation and increasingly are reaching a period of standardization. And as we reach that stage, we can talk more confidently about the processes, that there is a civic lottery, that there is a mandate from some public authority, that there is a deliberative process, and we have a, a similar sense as to what that might look like. And of course, there's now going to be very robust evaluation to again ensure the legitimacy and integrity and credibility of the work. And again, the OECD has been convening scholars to ensure that that evaluation is conducted in, in comparable and consistent ways. And of course, there's no better sign of success than when you start to attract some real critics. And I think that criticism is welcome because it, it will help safeguard this project against exaggerated claims, against overreach. Um, and it's going to continue to alert us to the important dimensions of this, um, namely some of the equity effects that are involved in convening and beyond. Now, some of these critics may be less thoughtful than others, but that comes with the territory. Most positively, we find ourselves being able to reach for a new bookshelf of literature 
supplied by smart people like David and Ellen and Michael and, and Nicole and, and many others besides. That wasn't a bookshelf that we could draw on even a decade ago. And the last thing I want to observe is the existence, not of a singular wave, but actually of a series of what we might think of as tributaries that are each contributing to this project. And I, I want to name the three of them because I think they're helpful in differentiating between some of the projects that we've already heard about today. So I, I think, you know, as we were fortunate to hear from Jane Souter on the Irish example, here's an instance of deliberative processes being used to address intractable national issues, where there's a real delta between public opinion and what any political party is able to deliver. And so by creating an extra parliamentary process that can address a matter in Ireland's case of, of constitutional significance, you're able to overcome that impasse. But then when we look to the Belgians and we look to a number of the municipal projects that we see coming online, we can see opportunities to hardwire citizen input into the existing apparatus in institutions of government. And whether it looks like randomly selected citizens serving adjacent to elected parliamentarians, or as we've seen in um, West Belgium, um, the uh, standing assemblies that then delegate topics to subsequent assemblies, this is a space for great innovation. However, there is a third tributary of which I, I find myself a kind of proud representative in, in a, a famously unsexy Canadian sort of respect. And, and that's the tackling the work of the regulatory state and using citizen deliberation to help government with many of the issues that might never rise above the fold on the front page of a newspaper, but which constitute the substance and workaday matters of government. And the reason why I think the regulatory work is so significant is that if we ever want to scale up opportunities for citizen deliberation, then there will never be enough seats in our modified parliaments and there will never be enough constitutional issues for us to tackle in order to afford exponentially more residents in our society the opportunity to exercise in Yankelevich's stirring phrase, public judgment. So let me talk about where next then, because if, like me, you subscribe to the kind of Stephen Jay Gould's school of punctuated equilibrium, we go through a period of consolidation that I think is underway, and then we spring forward again, and they're gonna be drivers of that evolution. And I, I have no monopoly on what they might be, but I wanna put out for some discussion what I think four might include. And the first is frankly, the role of philanthropy. Um, a, a good Canadian here, we have nowhere near the kind of philanthropic might of the US, uh, but, and it consequently have, I think, appropriately relied on, on public sector funding as they predominantly do in Europe. But I think it strikes many people as, as more than a bit strange that America with its great civic Republican tradition has yet to see the wave of innovation that has taken place in Europe. And so I can, I can look to major American philanthropies rattled by the Trump years, concerned about the polarization of the electorate and increasingly dedicating significant dollars to democracy programs. And uh, one project, a, a major new philanthropic venture, perhaps first amongst them. But it's also significant that Western democracies, feeling the threats posed by adversarial uh, foreign countries like China and Russia, and concerned about the democratic slippage that may be occurring, are increasingly talking about democracy as a national security issue. And democracy promotion is something that not only needs to occur abroad, but very much at home. And I think that points to very significant resources potentially entering this space. And I think in the US, it's going to look very, uh, different than the kind of national and EU level projects that we've been seeing. The most fertile space will be at the municipal level and at the state level. 
I also think there's generational change happening. You know, young leaders who are beginning their political careers at the municipal level and then moving on to state and national government, I think are increasingly alert to the failings of the status quo. And they come with a different idea of leadership, not as being the person with all of the singular answers, but as being someone who can frame and pose questions, who can convene and discuss. And for evidence of this, I, I again look to some of the political parties that are forming in Belgium, but elsewhere in, in Scandinavia, which have different dialogic traditions that I think are proving to be very fertile for this work. And then of course we have to point to institutionalization. There will be no substitute ultimately for governments uh, creating mandates around this work that establishes the kinds of expectations for substantive consultation that we see when we look to issues like environmental assessment and many other routine regulatory matters. Um, just a, a couple of other points to make. There are, of course, challenges on the horizon. I don't think there's anything uniquely liberal about the outcomes of any citizens' assembly process. And I think we're going to have to be very much watchful of the co-option and capture of these processes by populist entities. We might think of an urban assembly in Hungary that was there to advise the government on the treatment of refugees and borders. I think we're going to have to be very mindful of the use of these processes by well-intentioned NGOs that are looking to demonstrate public support for their concerns. And I think if we're to learn any lesson from the Canadians here with respect to the Ontario and BC assemblies, it's the hazards that come with when the first time you go to bat, you tackle something as unpopular with your political class as rewiring all the norms and incentives by which elected politicians began their careers. So I think we're entering a period of normalization. I think this should be welcomed, but I think there's some things that we're going to need to put in place to enable that propulsion. Well, we often talk in rooms like this about democratic theory and the connection to all of these august ideas and deep history. In the real world of government, too much of this work gets conflated with public consultation, participatory strategies, and at worst, communications. And it means that too often we go out to engage downstream in a policy process. It's essential that we push the deliberative project upstream that when government is writing mandate letters for ministers, when it's setting its agenda, it is also wiring in the opportunities and time that's required to involve citizens, not only in solving problems, but identifying them. Two years ago, we released a proposal called Game Changer, suggesting that the Canadian government should spend 5% of what it spends on a federal election each year to create a democratic action fund. If we were to do that, we would be able to afford 80 different citizens assemblies taking place across Canada. And within the space of 20 or 30 years, everybody would know somebody who had participated on a process. Now, as delighted as I am with the envelopes landing recently in Amsterdam, and the hundreds of thousands of letters we've sent through Canada Post. The reality is that running civic lotteries as we do right now is costly and onerous. And that's why I think it's interesting to look to the experience of the Danes and the Norwegians, which are using technology to convene, where there is trust in those channels of communication. So Norway recently had very high response rates to a civic lottery that it conducted by text. All right, as I conclude here, what is the larger project beyond the popularization of citizens' assemblies? It's something that I think goes absolutely to the core of one of the standing pathologies of liberal democracy, and that is its innate prejudice 
and regard for members of the public as being risks requiring management rather than being resources that can be tapped. And when we think about a second act for democracy, it's not only a thousand citizens' assemblies blooming to invoke a different American progressive tradition. I think to John Dewey, the great American pedagogue and pragmatist, who would tell us that we actually need a vision of democracy as a platform for learning and as a platform for human and social development. And that means that collectively, as a community building this way, we need to not only be thinking about how people are engaged, we need to think about how they have an opportunity to exercise their democratic fitness as productive agents in civil society and how they come to be more informed about the goings on and the issues that are ultimately shaping their lives. So three things here. This means the introduction of processes like civic challenges. As we've seen in Canada as part of our response to the Syrian refugee crisis, we managed to settle an additional 30,000 Syrians by inviting Canadians to create what were called groups of five. We left it to them to solve the problem of helping the successful integration of newcomers. And there's been a wonderful study running that compares the health and social outcomes of those who were settled through formal government programs and those who had more than 200,000 Canadian citizens raising funds and helping them find jobs and get their kids into school and get housing. And it won't surprise a group like this to hear that those who are sponsored by Canadians are doing better. We've just been through COVID. We've asked nothing of our public except to stay away from one another. 50,000 Canadians volunteered to help our government's contact tracing efforts. They never got called up. And in part, this is because in a technocratic state, we've lost the capacity to effectively mobilize and organize that civic capacity. We need to displace the billions of dollars that get spent on reputation management through our public communications function that largely exists to tell citizens as little as possible and replace that with a positive mandate around public learning. You know, when I think about Dewey, I think about Littman. And I, of course, I think about the great debate and the extent to which both the right and the left have given up on the idea of reason and knowledge and information as being critical to a healthy functioning democracy. We have had for the past 80 or 90 years a public opinion industry more interested in telling us what we like and don't like than actually shedding light on what we know and don't know. Lastly, democracy's second act is one where we conjoin the privilege of representation with the right of voting. But as Kali observed earlier, it has taken us the better part of 300 years to enfranchise our citizens. And it's a project that went well beyond the 1960s in the US and in Canada, as recently as the 90s we have been enfranchising people. So this is a long project for all of us. The arguments that are deployed at every opportunity against this vision are the same arguments employed to push back against the suffragettes, against those who have campaigned for such a basic right as the right to vote. It's always a vote. It's always an argument about capability. So what I've learned at Mass over these past 14 years and what I think will continue to prove true is that people want to say, but they're also willing to serve. And part of our opportunity is to find more inventive and inclusive ways to instantiate and create publics that can serve a vision of the society that so many of us want. The problem with all of this is not that we've been asking too much of people. Paradoxically, it's that we've been asking far too little. I'll stop there.
Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for this uh, very inspiring and insightful talk. Um, I think it's very interesting and important what you say about this larger project, this um, project in which we start to, we as a society start to consider people and citizens not so much as a risk, but as a resource. Um, and I think it's something that came up today a couple of times, that there still is a lot of skepticism towards sortition-based processes, deliberative processes, many politicians, many policy makers, but especially many citizens themselves, consider other citizens, everyday people, to be not smart enough or not educated enough to discuss complicated topics such as climate change or um, electoral reform. While I think, and I think many people here, um, one of the most revitalizing aspects of citizens' assemblies is the fact that they tap into that enormous source of creativity and knowledge and experience that is this kind of laying dormant in society and that we don't tap into enough. So how do you think we can make more use of that? How can we um, show the wider society, politicians, but other citizens as well, that everyday people are this very valuable resource of knowledge, of experience, of creativity? How do we make that visible? And is that a way to fight off that skepticism? Um, I'm just mindful of getting a little bit of feedback there. Um, what, I would, what I would say, I mean, you, you've made the very uh, correct observation uh, that we disparage the public constantly. I mean, we, we are haunted by this phantom public. We ascribe all kinds of terrible things to it. Of, of course, it doesn't exist, right? I, I prefer Dewey's definition of the public, which is a group of people who recognize they have a problem uh, to solve. And so it's a vision of a constructive public. But instead, we just trash talk the public all of the time. And, and COVID's been the worst of it, right? Um, I, I think this, this idea of sort of like Pareto's public, like we spend all of our time on, on the 20% or less that seems to be, you know, to some degree antisocial or deeply self-regarding. And we spend so little time properly acknowledging and venerating uh, the vast majority of pro-social members of society who are curious, kind, generous, publicly minded, um, and by no means angels, but certainly a good deal more decent uh, and, and, you know, uh, more community minded than, than the media would portray. But I also think that's where the public opinion industry has a lot to answer for, because it has also fueled this idea, and especially the gerrymandering and the, you know, binary political system in the U.S. that we're always on a knife's edge between 49 and 51 percent of people. And anyone who's actually spent time with, with members of the community know that given the opportunity to, to talk about values, to talk about issues, to, to hear from different sides, generally a strong majority of people will reach similar conclusions. So we're laboring under all of these mythologies that only serve to make the public look like a much riskier proposition than it is. And, and that's where I think not only do we need a world of change in our formal political systems, but we really need some changes in the, into how we think about publics popularly. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, here. Um, could there be a microphone here, over here? Yeah, um, my name is Margot Becker. I'm with Global Assembly. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more when you set, talked about central funding, what you have in mind. And if you're thinking about government funding, is there a negative to that? Well, in terms of um, the, trust, the trust factor of the public. Depends on the government, doesn't <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm sympathetic, especially as you're asking from Global Assembly, which I think is a, a fantastic and very exciting uh, project. And I, I know that you have obtained 
funding from a range of different sources and are to be commended. Uh, look, I, I think um, the question of, of direct government funding will be what we might all agree is a nice problem to have. Uh, and we're going to see jurisdictions start to explicitly invest in citizen deliberation. And those processes will be open to all of the scrutiny um, that you know other beneficiaries of public funding might be. Part of this new normalization of citizens' assemblies, I think, has to be to kind of get rid of the exoticism that surrounds a lot of this work. We need to go from kind of capital C, capital A, to small c, small a, and to recognize that there are going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And just there are thousands of task forces, thousands of committees, hundreds of royal commissions of various kinds around the world at any given point doing important work. This is a different democratic tactic that can manufacture legitimacy so that authority can be exercised, hopefully in a more satisfactory, responsive, and democratically robust way. And there will be uh, a range of funding sources, but we will never get to the scale that is required to make this part of our democratic culture unless government plays the exact same role for this work that it plays, as we see with the media outside of the United States, um, and many other critical functions of healthy democracies. Thank you. Um... You also were talking about the, um, the upstream strategy. Can you hear me properly? Because uh, you said there was some feedback. Yeah, okay. You were talking about the upstream strategy. Uh, you gave some examples of processes. Um, well, you made a distinction between the, the more constitutional, parliamentary, and the regulatory processes. Uh, but really, most of them are still, um, the agenda setting is mostly top down. and. What do you think about more bottom-up agenda setting, more from uh, uh, the people themselves setting the agenda and making sure that the topics that they feel um, uh, are most important are being discussed in deliberative processes? I think it's great. I mean, I'm, I, I, I think my response to, more, to, to many of these questions is more is simply more right now. And so if there can be, um, uh, you know, uh, strong pushes coming from various corners. The, you know, next-gen political leader who decides to disrupt their local council by introducing these processes. If it is an international NGO that decides to provide funding on a series of topics. Right now, as we're moving up that curve, it's about providing more exposure and more experiences to as many people as possible. And, you know, if we look to a country like Switzerland, which has had a long tradition of using petitions to um, uh, uh, enable uh, referenda, uh, I think it's before long we will see similar kind of structures introduced where petitions are used, I think a couple already exist, um, that require governments then to convene citizens' assemblies. At the end of the day, and this is going to vary by country and political culture, there is a question that has to shake out around who retains executive decision-making authority and the extent to which we're going to divest or delegate power, decision-making power, to any one of these bodies. But again, I think more is more, and we will learn from this exciting period of experimentation. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes, there are questions, online questions. Actually, this is my own question. Your own question. Um, thank you so much. This is really interesting. It's very exciting. Um, I, I just, I guess I'm curious, can a lot of what we heard today is about some of the conflict between democracy and capitalism and, and corporate influence. And so a, a, a part of me is very excited about, you know, obviously the expertise that, that you offer or your, your trend, your, your firm offers. The other part of me feels very wary about um, a for-profit company managing sortition. And is that just a, a step down another line of making democracy a commodity? Can you speak to that conflict? Uh, I, I can with great delight. I, I thought you were going to go in one direction, which was about um, 
the the correlation between unequal societies and their deliberative capacity. And I think that's one factor, again, why we see this work taking hold perhaps more in European countries with lower Gini coefficients. But that's a different question to didn't ask. You asked about mass, and I got it. Mass is a bit of an accident of history this way. Um, there were there, there were a few strategies that that we could have pursued on the other side of the Ontario Assembly, and maybe Mike smiling there because um, he was very much part of it. You know, uh, uh, being a, an incorporated company uh, is an anomaly in this space, but we have very very high levels of transparency around our contracts, our salaries. We operate. Um, much more like a non-profit than a uh, uh, for-profit business. And I would observe that there are virtually no other private sector firms who have in a serious and consistent way gotten into the space. Um, that's simply because you're not going to make money in it and it's never been our objective. Uh, could have tried to create an office of public engagement in the bowels of the Department of Public Works in the government of Ontario after the assembly. But the reality is that you would have had far less opportunity for innovation uh, and autonomy, and you would have been subject to the government of the day. I was reluctant at the time to um, be a charity uh, and, and kind of put out my hat and say, give me a fiver for democracy. And the reason there is because I saw all of the crappy public consultations that governments were commissioning. And I thought, well, for heaven's sakes, if we can't offer something of significantly greater value, given the funds that are already being expended, maybe this is all just a nice theory, but it doesn't work in practice. And I actually think that business discipline has been a kind of unique part of our experience with this work. Um, I mean, you might balk when I say this, but I actually think our interests are very much aligned. We're a mission-driven company. and. And we've always expected this was a, at least a 20 year project, which is to popularize this work, not to monopolize. The idea is that if we ended up taking a, on a bunch of clients who weren't sincere about actually translating the recommendations into impact, then that's not gonna be very good for our future as, a, as an organization or business trying to, to do this work. So we spend a lot of time saying no more often than we say yes. Um, and we're also set up so that while well, we run three or four of these a year, uh, it is not the lion's share of our revenue. And we actively cross subsidize from public sector strategy projects uh, over. I mean, this gets very detailed quickly, but I can also assure, and I think anyone who's run these processes appreciates, they are emotionally and cognitively demanding for the team. And running three or four of them in the space of a year is as much as you could possibly hope to take on we're grateful to be able to direct our energies to slightly less strenuous uh, activities in what we think of as the off season. So I, I don't actually think mass is much of a model. I, I think we're a kind of accident of history. It's a, it's a convenient, uh, low barrier uh, vehicle to pursue a particular project. And uh, the sooner that we're overtaken by, you know, well-funded government entities or, or other bodies, Great, have at her. <laughs> That's very clear. Any questions from the room? Yes, David. Hi, Peter. This is David van Raybroek. Great talk, and I admire the way you combine day-to-day -day work on democratic innovation in practice with developing long-term visions as you did today. One thing puzzled me you seem to be a little bit wary of Viktor Orban possibly organizing a mm. citizens' assembly. Peter, I would love him to do this. <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is a conversation we should all be having at the bar afterwards uh, <laughs> because I think it's, uh, it's to speculate. Um, look, we have seen the extent to which parliamentary institutions have been uh, seriously torqued. We've seen judiciaries lose their independence, uh, and we've seen uh, a sort of theatrics of democratic practice uh, totally uh, sour and debilitate what ought to be uh, more uh, rigorous, fair, uh, credible 
exercises of democratic power. And all I'm suggesting, I mean, I, I'm kind of like you. I, I, I think on the side of this, it's like, yeah, maybe citizens would give them a real piece of their mind and, and it, it could be uh, the basis for you know, some sort of civic movement. And, and that would be a wonderful thing. But I also know, uh, having been involved in the design of so many of these processes, the discretion that organizers employ in how they select speakers, in the amount of time that's afforded for deliberation, in how the sortition process works, um, and ultimately how the questions on the deliberation itself is framed. And I think those are quite susceptible to manipulation. It's why this external scrutiny and evaluation is, is so important uh, to keep these processes sober and honest. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have room for one last question. Anyone? Sorry, yes, they're in the... Oh, yes, they're right behind you, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Peter, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Jason Tony, and I'm actually from Montreal. I live in Montreal, so I appreciate um, hearing what you're doing in Canada. Um, I have a question and also some comment. First of all, I'm curious, what, if anything, have the assemblies that you've established actually achieved? Um, have they been able to express any decision-making power um, or uh, echo into some issue that's, that's been significant? Is there anything you can actually name? And then I think just to add to the conversation, as somebody involved in these types of things in, I'm going to just lower this, in, in Montreal, um, we've seen citizen assemblies in our city uh, accomplish quite a bit, and there's a rich tradition of neighborhood assemblies expressing um, power in the city. Um, in the 1970s, the Montreal Citizens Movement, which was inspired by the FRAP, the Front d'Action Politique, without going into too much history, um, set out to set up citizen assemblies, um, and it inspired a wave of them, although the party which took power later in the city um, never established more than um, district advisory councils, which you might be familiar with, which had limited power, but they did inspire a wave of neighborhood assemblies um, that did interesting things. Uh, that was around the time um, in which Milton Park, the Community Land Trust, was established, which is one of the largest community land trusts in North America, located right in the heart of downtown Montreal. Um, which has thousands of residents, which pushed off um, real estate speculators who were attempting to build giant skyscrapers and destroy um, um, historic heritage, Victorian buildings. Citizen Assembly stood up to those and pushed those out of the city and managed to protect those homes, and now they're nonprofit affordable housing. Um, Citizen Assemblies also helped create the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities in Montreal, which is an important document that was. Um, that protects, yep. Yeah. Oh, wrap it up. Okay, sorry. Um, well, all I, all I mean to add to this conversation is that in Montreal, there has been significant successes. What have you seen in other places in Canada? Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you for that. And, and look, I, I, I think that chronology you provided to remind all of us that we have seen, of course, many different waves of civic activism and organization take hold and then either be co-opted, evaporate, burn out for various reasons. And that's why it's so important that the Bard Center is, or, or the or Rent Center is organizing today's conference, that communities are being formed, that this isn't something happening in one jurisdiction. It is increasingly a global project because we will need to guard against this. And again, more is more. The best way of ensuring the long-term success of these projects is to seeing more happen with more people exposed to them. You asked about impact in Canada, and I urge you to take a look at our, our website. Next time you fly into Pearson, the flight path you follow in the time of day, determined by a randomly selected group of citizens. Uh, when you ride the Montreal transit system through ARTM, some of its fare policies, 
randomly selected citizens. If you live in a condo in Ontario, the governance of that building informed by randomly selected citizen panel. And if you pull out your digital ID in British Columbia, so there are many, 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 many instances, a coroner, um, because the, probably the closest analog to these processes are coroner's juries, non-adversarial courtroom processes, interested in making recommendations. I asked the Ontario coroner, I said, what's your batting average? He said, well, probably about two thirds of our recommendations to industry, government and society at large uh, take hold. We never read about this stuff. It becomes part of the fabric of society. And insofar as you're following the regulatory tributary, the de um, deliberative way, uh, that's where we'll find our impact. Um, the last thing I, I, I want to say is, is I think the core provocation I, I want to challenge everyone with, which is we won't get where we need to go if we stop with the few dozen or few hundred citizens who might get to attend parliament or participate in one of its new extensions or work on constitutional issues the question for us has got to be how do we make sure that every member of our society even once in their lifetime gets the proverbial brown envelope through their door and the invitation to act out a different way of exercising their citizenship. If we achieve that, we won't have solved the challenges of democracy, but I certainly think we'll have gone a measure towards revitalizing. Thank you. Ava, oh, sorry, yeah. Ava, this is film over here. We had one last question from a Bard High School student. Okay. If we, if we could take that. If that's okay with Peter. One last question from a Bard High School student. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Marley from the Newark Early College. And I was wondering, you stated briefly, very briefly, that um, using online resources and technology is way cheaper than sending actual letters and other forms of communication. So I was wondering if they also produce better outcomes, why is it that we don't do that instead of, instead of sending the messages? Like why don't we use technology and other online resources? Because we don't live in Norway. Uh, I'd love to see us try, but look, the biggest problem in, Amer in America telecommunications right now is, um, is air duct cleaning. Um, people are getting constantly robocalled, uh, the amount of spam that comes through on text if, if you had, in our case, Revenue Canada or the IRS purport to text you, you're immediately going to delete that. That is not the case in some countries that have pursued different digital ID and communications channels, and they have built in con those channels and conditioned their publics to trust them. That's what I mean about the technology that we can use to make for much more efficient recruitment. We also just went through last year, um, you know, during COVID, a virtual process, which would have been about eight days online with two languages and six time zones in Canada. It became 36 sessions, not something I would rush to repeat, but I think the hybridity, the opportunities for hybridity with technology like we're using today uh, definitely are to our benefit. Um, last thing I'd say being a high school student, Look, the single greatest thing anyone could do for the future of democracy, if you're thinking about the next generation, is blow up every elected student council and every elementary and high school you can find. Take all the tasks of vice principal and principal and student council, think about over the course of a year, make a schedule of it, and randomly select groups of citizens and give them the opportunity to start making the decisions early. Well, that's quite an answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your contribution. And um, well, we much look forward to the results of the current Citizens Assembly in, uh, in Canada. Good luck with that.